Um, I'm Susan Smiley, and I'm director of the Center for uh, Public Humanities, and I want to thank you all for coming. And my other um, job is to thank the speakers um, from near and far. Um, sometimes in Rhode Island, uh, it feels very far uh, to come up to the Brown campus, and we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and energy uh, to do that, and we surely appreciate uh, our colleagues um, from other campuses driving and flying and um, doing mixes of transportation uh, to get here. It's never, uh, it's never easy. I'm, I'm taking a little extra time to see if we can fix the sound and just to make sure everybody gets their muffins. Um, I, I, the last panel was so fabulous, and uh, we really appreciate all we've learned. Um, and there's just more fabulosity uh, to come. Um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, uh, introduce, um, yes, while, while we're still working on the tech, I'm going to introduce all the speakers at once and then ask them to come up um, uh, after each other in part to see if we can get the sound uh, working ahead of time. Um, so um, I'm lucky enough to uh, introduce and moderate this, uh, the second session, which is called the Prison to College Pipeline. Um, and we have four uh, amazing speakers. One of the things I don't always do, but I'll do today, is tell people where folks went to college and when they're co because we're so interested in college. <coughs> um, Christina Dawkins um, has come to us from the Hayman Center for Community Management <coughs> at Columbia University, where she's the program manager uh, for the Public Humanities Initiative and the Justice and Education <coughs> Initiative. Um, Christina spoke at the Center for Public Humanities yesterday uh, on the links between uh, humanity centers, public humanities, um, and um, human rights, and we, um, it was fabulous, and we learned a lot. So as we know, we'll learn more here. Um, Christina has her BA in Communication Studies from Northwestern and an MA in Human Rights Studies from Columbia. She's also worked for the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, the One Campaign in the Obama for America. Um, the second speaker will be Baz Dreisinger, uh, who is the founder and academic director of John Jay's Prison to College Pipeline Program, uh, which offers college classes and re-entry planning to incarcerated men at the Otisville Correctional Facility in particular, uh, and which works more broadly to increase access to higher education um, for those incarcerated. Um, Baz has a PhD in English from Columbia and American and African American Studies, always one of our faves. Um, her first book is called Near Black, White to Black Passing in American Culture, and her latest, Just Out, um, which Christina says is the best book she's read on incarceration in a long time, uh, called Incarceration Nations, A Journey to Justice in Prisons Around the World. She also has a career as a public intellectual, writing about race and pop culture for a range of outlets. Uh, closer to home, I'm pleased to uh, welcome James Montero, who's founder and director of the Prison Bridge program in Rhode Island. Uh, James dropped out of school in the eighth grade and spent most of his adult life in and out of the penal system, including his last 10-year stretch in Baltimore, Maryland's penitentiary. There he earned an associate's degree in psychology with honors, and after release, a BA degree in community development at Roger Williams College's Roger Williams College Unbound Program. Roger Williams University um, is, has a, a, a campus in uh, Bristol, Rhode Island, and has just opened a downtown campus um, in Providence. For those of us in Rhode Island, uh, we're very proud of this work, founding the Billy Taylor House, um, which works with youth in the Mount Hope neighborhood of Rhode Island. We aren't the only ones proud and impressed. He's a member of the 2015 Echoing Green Fellowship class. That's a big deal. Um, and, and I um, am very pleased that he could be here with us today. Finally, we have Nick Horton. Uh, we're proud of him, too. He has a bachelor's in applied science and um, biology from Brown, uh, where he worked on the Indy uh, and with worked with the Student Labor Alliance. We're always proud when our former students stay here and make a difference. Um, he's the pro Nick is the program coordinator and policy specialist at Open Doors Rhode Island, where he's worked for 12 years. Uh, at Open Doors, he runs the Nine Yards program, which provides long-term intensive support to high-risk offenders. So we're going to start with Christina. How are we doing? Not going to happen. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll just have to pull the microphone down. Okay. You have, it's that. no big deal. We'll put the microphone next to the uh, computer speaker, oh. and everybody will be able to hear it great. It's okay. just not, you know, it's not the 5,000 degree perfect that we want. It's pretty darn good. 
If it doesn't, it doesn't have to. It's not a big deal. Yeah? Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you um, for inviting me uh, for yesterday and today. Um, so, I guess how I would like to start is by saying just about three years ago, Columbia could have been having this conference ourselves. Um, we had Columbia faculty who'd been teaching inside prisons, but not as part of a Columbia run program, not uh, with Columbia accredited courses. Um, it was a little less than three years ago that the Heyman Center for the Humanities and the Center for Justice um, created a partnership to build a public humanities, uh, I'm sorry, a justice and education initiative, um, which has four different programs running out of it. Um, one is the prison education program where Columbia faculty and graduate students teach at Sing Sing, uh, which is a max security men's prison, and um, at Bedford Hills, which is a max security women's prison, and to Connick, which is a medium security women's prison. Um, that's one project. Another is the Rikers Education Program, where we do um, arts and justice intensive workshops that run for about six weeks, because the average stay at Rikers, which is a jail, is around three months. Um, that program is targeting uh, youth and young adults ages 16 to 21. Um, the third program uh, is the Justice and Education Scholars Program, which is for formerly incarcerated adults who began their college education on the inside and have come home and would like to continue um, working toward college. So um, it's used as a bridge program where they come and take a humanities course on Columbia's campus. And um, then subsequently they can take one one course on campus that's matriculating with matriculating students until they actually enroll in a program for themselves. Um, and then the fourth program is called Changing the Narrative, where we're trying to change the conversation around incarceration, um, changing the, the rhetoric that we use instead of convicts and felons to um, incarcerated people or formerly incarcerated people. Um, we also have a research collective that's comprised of formerly incarcerated adults who are learning research methods while um, collecting video, doing video interviews with what the reentry pro process is like, um, the challenges that they're facing to create an oral history archive for Columbia's libraries, and hopefully um, creating a more public friendly sort of YouTube documentary video, but that's that's in the works for later. So what I would like to show you is just a brief video that maybe will work. If not, then I can just talk a little bit more about it. But this is an overview of, of what we're doing. I taught a course under Columbia's new Justice and Education Initiative. It targets formerly incarcerated adults who have been enrolled through Columbia's Justice and Education Initiative, funded by the Mellon Foundation. In 2013, I was released from prison after serving seven years and eight months out of a nine-year sentence. In prison, the educational options are very limited. They're very different to what they teach you in there. They, they, they allow you more vocational skills than they do actual academics. So you might end up in a prison that has college programs, which is wonderful, but the space is limited, it's very hard to get into. And in time, they transfer you from prison to prison when you're in the middle of the program, and other prisons won't offer the same program. Columbia faculty have been involved at, with uh, the prison and providing education in the prison for as long as I've been here, and that's almost 25 years. Uh, what is fantastic is to see these efforts of individual faculty and students uh, now being consolidated in the work of the Center for Justice and especially in the Justice and Education Initiative. The Center for Justice sends people into the prisons to teach, faculty into the prisons to teach. We made it our kind of goal, mission, to offer a class that would serve the four men of incarcerated on this campus. Um, and it seemed to me that the core, particularly literature, humanities, and contemporary civilization, which are the, the first year and second year courses that all Columbia kids take, that 
to offer a course like that that could be a gateway course into human a humanities major. Seven justice scholars that we have this year, they're, all of them are going on to four-year programs, and two of them are starting at GS, at General Studies, this semester. The figures that show the, uh, that, that African Americans are much more likely to be in prison than, than white Americans, or, and that Latinos are somewhere in between, comes home really starkly when you go into the prisons. And the fact that Columbia is in a neighborhood, is in one of the neighborhoods that give um, to the prisons more than any other neighborhoods. It's, there's about six neighborhoods and Harlem is one of them. Um, the, uh, and that Columbia, I think, has a special um, responsibility to uh, create opportunities and what, as an institution, we can do to transform that. For so long and, and so often and in so many contexts, liberal arts education has been seen as the prerogative of a privileged few. And what we want to encourage uh, is a vision of humanistic education that encompasses all people, no matter what their backgrounds are, and that equips them with the tools to see themselves as contributing to the fabric and texture of their society. So we see liberal arts instruction as a way of empowering individuals to use these texts that they're reading, to critique these texts that they're reading, as a way of down the road becoming better citizens of the society of which they form part. You have all of these all these obstacles in front of you. So to have a school like this offer a program like that to men and women who come out of prison and are trying to do something positive with their life, I think is fabulous. And I, and I really commend it. The experience was amazing. It really was. Okay, so thank you for getting the, the sound working. <laughs> that worked. Um, so I think what I'll talk about after hearing the, the first panel is um, how we sort of went about this um, in the other direction with at Columbia, where we started doing things on campus and then in Rikers Jail and then more broadly in, in the prisons upstate. Um, so uh, the actually the scholars program, Isaac Scott, who was in the first, first cohort, that started running before we started accrediting Columbia courses inside. Um, the Scholars Program and the Rikers Education Programs, because um, the Rikers bit didn't actually, they're not awarded college credit because they're six week workshops, um, that started going right away because we didn't really need uh, Columbia permissions to have that happen. Um, the Scholars Program, we started partnering with the School of Professional Studies and the English department, basically through faculty champions who wanted to see this program get off the ground. And so once the English department accredited this course that was made for people who were formerly incarcerated, and the School of Professional Studies um, is the one who they donate the credit toward the program. Um, so that doesn't cost, that's how we give them the tuition scholarships to take the course. Once that model was in place, um, the professors who were already teaching inside um, inside prisons were able to make the argument that we can get Columbia credit happening in Sing Sing and Taconic and Bedford. So um, it started with having uh, Christian Mercer, who is a philosophy professor at Columbia, and she's much beloved, and she also has a um, I forget what it's called, but she writes articles for the Washington Post. And so she went and taught a class that was not Columbia accredited, but then she wrote up an article that was published in the Washington Post and got a lot of positive attention. Um, then she recruited uh, another faculty member to teach, um, Geraldine Downey, who is, she has lots of affiliations, <laughs> and um, she's in the psych department. She was able to champion getting more professors teaching. Um, Carl Hart, who has uh, drugs and behavior, and he was just featured in a documentary, um, The House I Live In. And so it was really identifying professors who had high profiles and would be able to get the administration on board for what we're trying to do. Um, the partnership with the School of Professional Studies is key. They're the ones who give the credits inside, so it's not costing um, the Justice and Education Initiative any of the money um, from the grant, which would take a lot. We do pay our professors and the TAs to go teach inside, but we don't pay for the tuition credits. 
Um, so at this point, we have five classes running each semester and one class, but only one class in the summer. Um, we're trying to grow that. We do this through a partnership with Hudson Link. Um, they're in upstate New York and they run the degree program for the colleges for uh, Mercy College and Marymount College. So our professors, they go in, they teach a course, they earn Columbia credits, which are transferred into the degree program that the students are in inside. So the relationship with Hudson Link works as, um, in this class, there are 20 students and their past their associate's degree, so they need an advanced class maybe not in English, but in another liberal arts, humanities subject, and then we say, oh, we have this professor who's in the philosophy department. He would like to teach logic and rhetoric. And then they say, oh, that fits, and um, set up the really long bureaucratic process of getting them um, all the way in with filling out applications and fingerprints and orientation and the interview and references and book orders and getting the PDFs approved and getting their TA approved and getting things scheduled and this doesn't work anymore. So actually the Rhode Island system sounds so much nicer <laughs> than, than what we're currently um, experiencing. But uh, once they're in, um, they, they love it and they continue teaching and they recruit more professors to come teach. So like Rob said, we really don't have a, a problem with recruiting professors. It's uh, more getting um, them to make the, the time commitment to go all the way in. And um, also having them understand that uh, their classroom isn't their own, that the materials do have to get approved and um, that things are, are a little bit more regulated, not a little bit, a lot a bit more regulated there with um, technology limitations and, and what they can bring in. But overall, we're going into, I guess, our second full year of running courses upstate year round. And um, things are, I think things are going well. They're growing and they're moving in a direction where what's happening on campus and what's happening in the prisons is growing at the same time. So there's this growing momentum. More and more people are interested and in getting involved in this work. Um, the undergraduates are more involved in Rikers because there isn't um, a credit, they, there aren't credits given. Um, and then faculty and graduate students work upstate. Um, and the scholars program, it's wonderful when people actually come home, they can continue and get involved in the Columbia community. And we're having more and more students get accepted into Columbia to stay, which is also shifting the atmosphere on campus. There's a new student group forming of all students who are formerly incarcerated or are children of incarcerated parents. Um, so that's the, the general overview, and I guess I'll, I'll answer more specific questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, first of all, Susan and Marissa, for organizing this wonderful event. I have to say it's also so nice for those of us doing this work to be able to talk to each other and learn about it. It's, it's actually an incredible thing how many of us don't know what the other is doing. And so it's so important that we have spaces like this to be able to, to learn from each other. Um, and I know it's been incredibly useful for me, especially as as I'm going to get into, we're now expanding um, quite dramatically. And so there's a lot on my mind. And, and this has been really, really useful. So um, I thought I would talk you through the kind of birth and evolution of the prison to college pipeline and then end with um, thoughts about the future of it as, as the program grows. I was about uh, 10 years ago, I was volunteering in an educational capacity in prisons. And I got asked a question by a superintendent. And that is, why doesn't John Jay College of Criminal Justice the criminal justice branch of City University of New York have any program in a prison, any, any educational program in a prison. And um, I had no answer to that question, so I went into the president's office and he agreed to let me start one. 
And I think what's so interesting about that question is that it says something very profound. The question wasn't, why should you? Why should, sh why should Brown get involved? But how could you not, right? I mean, you are the City University of New York. You're John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This is your community. You're about educational access. How can this not be something that you do? Um, and I think that is so critical because although we've been talking about recidivism rates and so on and so forth, that is not the essence of what this work is about at all. Um, the, yes, it's a useful thing in terms of promoting the program and talking about public safety, but education in prisons is a civil rights issue, it's an equity issue, it's a human rights issue, um, and it's about giving people what they should have gotten in the first place, which is access to education. So, and I think those of us doing the work really talk about this strongly. And, and I will say too that walking in this morning and seeing that monument, uh, the slavery monument right outside there, that incredible <laughs> monument um, also makes it hit home. Why does Brown have to do this? Because Brown owes. And we all do. So, um, so anyway, in developing, um, in developing the program, our thinking was how can we do something that is um, powerful but also innovative? And that's how the prison to college pipeline model developed. The thought was really to, number one, think about educational timing. At what moment or moments in someone's uh, time incarcerated is education kind of particularly useful, particularly um, going to hit at all the right chords, and we looked at a series of studies done about demands and needs as people were coming home, and the number one thing that people were asking <coughs> for was education. Um, and then the other thought was, what about giving people, in a sense, the best of both worlds, so that you get to make use of your time on the inside, uh, accruing college credits, and then also benefit from everything that happens on a college campus that's so much bigger than the classroom. Internships, community building, um, free food, counseling. I always tell my students at John Jay, this is the one time in your life where you're gonna get free counseling, free tutoring, free healthcare to some degree, take advantage of that. So who is better poised to uh, benefit from all of these things, all of this, this wonderful community building, internships, um, a new uh, all, all access to all of these services than people coming home from prison. Um, so hence the pipeline model was born. And initially too, we immediately thought about partnerships. How can we do this in a holistic way? Who do we need to partner with? So we partnered with the Osborne Association, which is a reentry group around giving our students help with parole board appearances, housing, jobs, the greatest challenges of reentry, jobs and housing. Um, and we also partnered with an organization that is now actually under the John Jay umbrella, and that's College Initiative, which assists people impacted by the criminal justice system with pursuing higher education. So they work with our students on financial aid, um, mentorship, all kinds of things as far as becoming college students on the outside. And so what we offer um, in, in a nutshell, number one, we offer courses, of course. Our students take uh, two, 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 and now sometimes three courses per semester. They take them in a range of disciplines. Uh, we focus on general education requirements for CUNY because the idea is get those under your belt and then when you come home, get the degree and think about major. Um, so we've offered pretty much all the standard gen ed courses across the board. Our faculty come, uh, it counts as part of their teaching load. So it's considered a regular CUNY course and you come in, you teach it off site. Uh, we do have a community college partner, uh, Hostos Community College in the Bronx, which we partnered with a couple years ago. Uh, we did that actually initially because simply it saved us money. It's cheaper to pay for it. We, we pay tuition. Uh, we have not asked the CUNY Board of Trustees for permission to waive tuition for our students. So we actually pay tuition for our students and it was cheaper to do it through a community college. But also it enormously benefits us because uh, students, some come home and transition right into John Jay, others come uh, and go right into the community. College depends on where they're at. Um, the other thing that we do with our students is uh, create learning exchanges. And these are sort of like the inside out classes that you may be familiar with once a month. <clears throat> and we only do it once a month because the prison is two hours out of, out of uh, the city. So it's quite a journey. We couldn't possibly be up there more than once a month with students. Uh, but the students come up once a month and they sit in class alongside their incarcerated peers, 
They take classes um, led by a range of faculty members. They're one-off classes. They do advanced readings for it. So again, faculty from across the board coming up, teaching a single class. It's another wonderful way to involve faculty that isn't the commitment of teaching an entire semester. They get to come up and lead one class. And um, the, both sets of students get credit for this. They write a paper at the end, a kind of summation of their experiences. And the other thing we have are workshops on how to succeed in college and life, both on the inside and thinking ahead to coming home. So that's the nuts, nuts and bolts of our program. We, one of the things that we've been when focusing on is developing our developmental ed programming, and that's really flourished in the past couple of years. We now offer um, pre-college prep programs for the CUNY assessment test, which we use as, a, as an admissions tool. Uh, we offer that in several different facilities. I should say that recruitment-wise, we recruit from four prisons around New York State, and in partnership with the Department of Corrections, the accepted students are transferred to Otisville. Um, so, and we use the CUNY assessment test as part of our admission. So what we now offer are actually information sessions where we go into prisons around the state. I fly up to Syracuse. I did actually earlier this, this week. This is my runaround week um, for prisons in two days, doing information sessions about our program, but also about dispelling myths around higher education and incarceration and letting people know that, yes, you are eligible for financial aid when you come home despite many people's perce perception that they're not, uh, giving them information about CUNY, encouraging people to take the exam, even if you're coming home too soon to start our program or you think you might not come to our program, um, and letting people know about their opportunities when they come home. And uh, so we've now developed, for those who don't pass the exam, classes that assist them to pass the exam and that get them ready to do some college writing. Uh, we do these information sessions, as I was saying. The other thing that we started to develop in line with that um, growing developmental ed is what I call the pipeline to the pipeline, which is a kind of igniting interest in higher education period among many people who maybe never thought about college, never thought about learning as being particularly interesting. And so we are partnered with the Tribeca Film Institute and we bring up films, um, very new, exciting, vibrant films with their directors and producers, sometimes with actors. Um, and we actually have a team of men uh, who are trained as facilitators of discussion after these films. And we get at least a couple hundred uh, guys coming to these. We started at Otisville in one prison, now we expanded to another prison. And through that program alone, the, the experience of sitting in this vibrant discussion about film and realizing how much fun these dialogues can be and how incredible learning is, we've now attracted a good number of people into the program itself, um, which is really, really wonderful. So thinking ahead, and I'll end by talking about the benefits of this <coughs> to so many different sectors of the college community, uh, we were, we're now expanding. And we're expanding as uh, one of the Second Chance uh, Pell Grant grantees. So, uh, and some of you might be familiar with this, this is Obama's experimental initiative to bring Pell funding back into the prisons. And uh, so some of us have been selected to be that grand experiment, hooray for us. Um, so that's, and that's really, really wonderful in all kinds, of expansion is fantastic. And what our expansion is gonna look like is we are increasing our numbers, of course. So at Otisville, the prison we're at, we are growing, we're gonna double in size there. And we're also adding actually an associate's degree so that we're able to open the pool to, it's gonna remain a pipeline for some, for others, um, given that Otisville sadly is a place that's home to many lifers and long-termers who weren't eligible for our program, we now have an option for them too, that you can actually get the associates inside. So it's a combo of the two. And we are also um, now gonna have a facility right in New York City. Uh, we've, we, we convinced the Department of Corrections to give us basically half the beds at a facility that's now being used as a short-term stay facility and um, is gonna be transformed into a longer stay facility for people pipelining into CUNY. So I call it CUNY prison. It's not going to be called that officially, but that's how it'll, that's how it'll operate. So we'll be able to have um, more students from the outside come in which is wonderful. We're gonna have more mixed classes. And of course, we'll, we'll have um, at least 100 
men be enrolled over there. So I think, um, and all that is wonderful. I should say one of the great challenges of the program, and especially now that Pell is in the mix, number one, um, I often say that running the program on the inside, while it has its unbelievable bureaucratic headaches that we all commiserate on doing this work, in some ways is dwarfed by the challenges of reentry and the students coming home. There is so much need on that end for support, for mentorship, for the basics like jobs and housing. Um, and so I feel like college campuses, again, thinking of Brown here, have this really profound role to play in the crisis of reentry. I mean, it is a absolute crisis. There are not enough jobs, there's not enough housing, there's not enough kind of mentorship and love, loving mentorship that, that people are getting coming home and education and campuses are so well poised to do that as Christina's program has done for, for many of our students. Um, and the other great challenge has to do with money. One of the illusions about the Pell funding returning is, oh great, now you're all, you know, you've all got lots of money and everything's gonna be, be easy to run. On the contrary, the money only goes toward tuition and not overhead. So every Pell grantee now has um, you know, 100 times the workload and overhead with none of the funding support. And many foundations are sadly pulling out now because they think, I mean, our, our program is funded by Ford Foundation. Our initial funding came from the David Rockefeller Fund. We've got money from other foundations. Uh, but a lot of places are saying, you know, everyone's all good now. The government is stepping in so we can pull back. That is not the case. So there's just as much need. Uh, I'll end by summing up what I think everyone has, has been alluding to, which are the benefits of this to so many pieces of the community, right? So for, our, for students on campus, as has been talked about a lot, um, the students who come up to the learning exchanges, it changes their lives. And unlike um, many other places, I mean, the CUNY community, when our students walk into the prison classroom, minus the green uniforms, you don't know who's who. They come from the same neighborhoods, they come from the same community, um, which certainly makes doing a mixed class scenario a lot easier, it reduces some of the kind of voyeurism and petri dish thing that can happen in the context of a mixed classroom, um, which we get less of, which is wonderful. But I can still say that even though many of these students have had family members members who are incarcerated, um, may have actually been incarcerated themselves, may have direct contact with the criminal justice system, to sit in an intellectual environment like this with their incarcerated peers, as peers, not as tutors, not as I'm better than you, but as peers, changes their lives. We've had students change their entire career paths, go for, um, a student was pursuing law school and ended up doing a JD. Uh, combined with a social work degree, so it alters. And for a school of criminal justice, I mean, I'm not sure how much more vital something like this could be. It has also been critical for them as kind of ambassadors on campus spreading the word. They, I mean, I often talk about the, the wall breaking down here is between both the prison, you know, the prison and the u university in both ways. We want to bring the university to prison, but also bring the prison to the university. And so it's been a very powerful thing the way the word has spread about the program. Um, the gospel has spread about the people in prison are not the people you think they are, how smart my peers are. Um, what it is for even for student learning, how much more intense these classes are. I mean, not only are they hardly watered down, they are often twice as difficult and rigorous as the, stu as the ones on campus. And I have students coming out saying things like, God, it was great that nobody was texting during class and everyone had done the reading 20 times over <laughs> with highlighters, with underline, you know, with still carrying old school dictionaries, looking things up if they don't understand a word. Um, what that does for students is enormously powerful in terms of invigorating their college careers, and I think that's a tremendous selling point. The same is true for faculty. I've heard faculty say again and again how much this um, reignited their love of teaching. Faculty beg me to come back every year, so we never have a problem recruiting faculty, even though it's a four-hour commute. Our, our faculty are so hungry to do this because of the teaching experience. And then, of course, I mean, what this does in terms of incarcerated students' lives is immense. And I think it operates on several different levels. I'll end by just talking about two of our students as kind of examples. Um, so one of our students, his name is Sean, 
he actually only ended up spending a semester with us. We require a year, a minimum of a year, and um, the maximum is five years. So we, we generally look for students with it between one and five years of release for the prison to college pipeline. Sean ended up with some good time and, and left early. So he did just one semester um, in my class. And to this day, um, he is, he's, he's faced a lot of health problems since coming home. He's been working. He's way out on Long Island. So he hasn't started school. I'm not sure, or continued school, rather. I'm not sure he will. Um, but he comes to every single one of our alumni events, however far it requires him to travel. He comes to events at John Jay. He's in close touch with his two professors that he took classes with. I get texts from him every single week saying, good morning, how are you today? Um, and he calls me for advice about things. He calls his other professors for advice about things. And he feels part of a campus, even though he is not enrolled right now and may never well be. The impact of having been a college student at one time in your life um, in the context of incarceration changes you, changes the way you think about your capabilities in the world and what you do. Um, and that is tremendously powerful. Um, the other student that I'll talk about, Devon, Devon um, had quite a dramatic incident happen to him on his way out of prison. He did two years in the program, accrued um, a good number of credits, was a star student, was recognized in, um, at John Jay and honored as having some of the best student writing of the year. Um, absolute mentor to other people. On the day of his release, he was kidnapped, and actually some, his old enemy came out of the trunk and shot him. He was airlifted to Westchester Medical Center. They saved his life. This was in October. Um, and with his arm in a sling, with bullet casing still in his arm, shoulder, and back, he started school in January. And he could not even type because it was his right arm. Um, so he started school in January. And as of May this year, he graduated with honors from Hostos as our first graduate. Um, and Devon is now, he's now at John Jay going for his bachelor's, soon his master's, soon his PhD, soon like the US presidency. But um, Devon is also recently stood on stage with the Secretary of Education at the uh, convening around the Pell Grant initiative. He was one of three students chosen. So seeing him up there, you know, just less than two years after this incident, um, speaking with the Secretary of Education. He's gonna be coming with me to um, Cambridge University in England where he's been invited to speak both in the prison and on campus about the work that they're trying to do with prison mm -hmm. education. He's coming with me to South Africa in January um, for a study abroad program, all while still on parole. So um, it's, it's all a very incredible thing. I think his story is supernatural in a sense, but it is representative of you know, the level of commitment of these students and the incredible transformation here. So thank you. information yeah give us one minute I'm glad I came and I agree with um, I'm sorry prison to pipeline I agree with what you said this is really an opportunity for us to get together and really understand what's going on because there's a lot of intersection there's a lot of collaboration that could happen and I really look forward to speaking to you guys afterwards. I was gonna read this, but I really don't even think that I need to read that at this point, because I think everybody is on the same page in regards to that. So what I'm gonna do from here is I'm gonna start out with a video, and then I'll go into what the Prison Bridge Program at College Inbound is all about. 
So we will start out with this, and this is a draft. We are actually working on this, but I wanted to play this because it kind of opens up very well. Good. Unmute. Good. Education is the key. The reason being is because education provides you the choices. I heard about College and Bone in prison. College and Bone embraced us. They allowed us to come with a plan and what we wanted to achieve in life. They gave me the platform for that. Basically, College and Bone is helping me make my dreams come true. I'm passionate about giving back to the community that I helped destroy. There's a lot of people that are incarcerated right here in society because they're stuck. The more education you provide somebody with, the less likely he is to go out there and commit crime because he's able to take care of himself. By finding these individuals' education, you level the playing field. Um, again, my name is James Montero. I'm the founder and director of the Prison Bridge Program that is happening at College Unbound. Prior to being in this position, I spent approximately 20 years of my life incarcerated up and down the East Coast. Um, I was done with incarceration the first time I was incarcerated, but because I had an eighth grade education, every time I came home, I had no ability to acquire any type of employment that would allow me to sustain myself or a family, which always led me going back to what, me, what brought me back to prison in the first place. The last time I was incarcerated was in Baltimore, Maryland, and I decided enough was enough, and I came up with an equation, and that equation was more education would equal more money, would equal more choices, would equal more freedom. More education would equal more money, would equal more freedom. And the equation wasn't really talking about physical freedom, it was more so talking about freedom of choice. So I went back to school. I'm a GED, got my associate's degree, and when I came home, because when you're in, when, I think prison education is happening, it's starting to happen across the country, but what's happened is, when you get an associate's degree, the, the cost of bachelor's degree balloons significantly, and I was stuck. I stayed in prison for another two and a half years, waiting to be released, and once I was released, I tried to go back to school, but what happens when somebody comes home from prison who's 30 or 40 years old is life on life's terms shows up. And it's either get a job or go back to school. Or it's either fend for myself or go back to school. And at some point, getting a job and standing on my own two feet uh, takes over. I tried to go back to school. A lot of places would not accept my credits. They were telling me to start all over. I was, doors were being closed. And at that point, I had given up. And I got the job with an associate's degree. The first job I got was a $5 an hour job. The guy was abusing me because it's illegal to pay somebody $5 an hour, but he couldn't afford to do that, and I couldn't afford not to take the job. So I took the job because I was living in the house with my wife, and I was going to pay one of those bills. Um, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to this College Unbound program, which introduced me to project-based learning. And let me tell you something, everybody in prison has an idea. Everybody. Sometimes they're not good ideas, but everybody, <laughs> let me tell you, 
everybody has an idea. Um, and I had created a program while I was in prison that was just sitting on the shelf uh, collecting dust. And what College Unbound did was cause me, matter of fact, his name's Adam Bush, he's right over there. He caused me to pull that back off the shelf, dust the dust, uh, dust, the dust off of it, and start to put it to work. Uh, through that, I was able to create the Billy Taylor House, which provides workforce development and enrichment opportunities for youth aged 15 to 21 in the Mount Hope neighborhood. I raised approximately around $500,000 in a matter of three years, and I was donated a building by Bank of America, which is being rehabbed, uh, to create for-profit businesses that I funneled back into a nonprofit structure. We opened a barbershop and a cafe, and we hired the kids in this, in, in this building. Um, and then I decided through College Unbound, we needed to create some sort of program for individuals who are incarcerated. Um, and this is the inception of what the Prison Bridge Program is. The Prison Bridge Program is a program that helps individuals who have started education behind the walls be able to finish once they're released. And that's our target audience. Our target audience is the people that are coming home. Um, we start behind the walls when every, every facility within the Department of Corrections, with, with the exception of the intake and maximum um, high security. Um, and what we do is we offer a year worth of credits. Uh, students refer to us, usually we, we work with CCRI. We usually take the people that CCRI has finished and we give them an additional 12 to 15 credits, which brings them to like 60 to 80 credits. And what we do is uh, uh, we offer them project-based learning also. Uh, because every, again, everybody has a project inside of prison. And then once we, we, we help them with transition as far as being released, we connect them with a case manager upon release, and that helps with them with employment, mental health care, medication, substance abuse counseling, whatever these individuals need, we try to help them because the last thing we want them to do is, is all of these issues tend to pull you away from education. We want them to be able to focus on education, so these things have to be dealt with. That's our case manager over there, which just wound around. And we also help them six months towards their release. This is when we begin to connect them with these, these services. Um, we also help connect them with a registration specialist, which is Jill Van Leesten, which helps them provide them with financial aid support, filling out the FAFSA, conduct educational assessments, bring their credits together, and helps them transition and get, get ready for the transition to enter the college when they come home. And the biggest piece I say to this, the biggest piece I say to this, because when I came home, I knew I was capable of operating on this level, but there's always that thing in the back of my mind that's telling me it'll never work for me. It'll never work for me. And that's been in my mind ever since I was a young child. That's why I didn't want to go to school in the first place. And when I came home, everybody was like, go see Barry, go see Barry. A friend of mine runs the financial aid department at CCRI. And I went to see Barry, and I'm looking at Barry, because I used to go to school with Barry, went to Catholic school, my grades were better than his. Barry was the one that would get us in a fight on Thayer Street because he drank too much. And I'm looking at him, but Barry had some issues in his past also. And I'm looking at him, and he's like, James, you need to do this, you need to do this. And I'm sitting here like, in, in mid-sentence, how the frick did you do that? How did you do that? And he said, James, the more letters I got behind my name, the less my background mattered. And that was a light bulb moment for me that told me that everything I had told myself was a lie. And that's what this serves. Because when they come out of prison, they don't come out to a random college. They come out to a cohort of people that they actually just left them two to three months prior who are out here already, and they're working towards their bachelor's degrees. And it's become, it becomes a huge support group. It becomes a huge support group. So these individuals that are already out pursuing their degree serve as mentors for the ones that are getting ready to come home. We had a few individuals come on. One individual started his course behind the walls. He got released in the middle of a course. He was able to finish that course when he stepped foot outside in, in, in the uh, steps of College Unbound. Then he came home, and then what happens is his classmates behind the walls are starting to come home, and he's there waiting for them. So this is the biggest thing that I say that we do as far as College Unbound. We offer that support, and that, that, uh, that mindset is being challenged. Um, by the people that are out doing it. So, outside the walls, students are connected to peer learning communities of previously incarcerated individuals and mentors. Uh, they attend a new student orientation. That gateway class is imperative. 
because a lot of our students are having uh, issues with computers, they're having issues with technology, they're having issues with writing, so we want to give them this gateway class first. Uh, they meet one-on-one -on -one, one with an academic advisor, and our case manager stays with them throughout this process. Uh, we have close partnerships that are developed with employers. Alex and Ani has taken on our students. They hire our students. Um, we are connecting with other employers, DOT, as we speak, so our students have access to employment um, so they can focus on school. And they one-on-one -on -one support with financial aid process because they really need to understand, especially with bachelor's degrees, because you're not going to be able to survive. You're not going to be able to get a bachelor's degree with financial aid alone. You're going to have to take out some sort of student loans, some sort of, some sort of aid. So they need to understand this process before they get themselves into it. The greatest thing about it is that most of the students, when they come home, they already have like 80 to 70 to 80 credits. So buy-in's already there. And like I got out of school, I owe $10,000. I actually paid my student loans off already. So it was good for me. I didn't acquire a lot of debt. And then what we do is lead them to graduation and our successful reunification and stability with their families. I want to say this. I want to say that choices thing is very important. It is very important. I don't believe, everybody's, I believe the new discrimination in this country is not if you're black, not if you're white, not if you're green, not if you're purple. I believe the new discrimination in this country is if you have education and if you don't. And that's why it's, so, it's being made so hard to get it. Because if you don't have it, you can't compete. And you're left out of a lot of processes. So with me, I always push towards education. Um, and you're right. And I'm a former offender. And I get sick and tired of coming to, to uh, symposiums and stuff, and education is nowhere on the table. And if you ask any of us, you ask any of us, most of us will tell you we want to do it for ourselves. We're not looking for a handout. And we're fully capable of doing it ourselves. 60%, 67% of formerly incarcerated survey participants reported that they wanted to return to school. Only 27% were able to. This is not a, a, a lack of a desire. This is lack of a pathway. This is lack of a pathway. And I think what we need to do, and I, you're right, Brown is responsible to this because they have weight, is to really put the pressure on to open that pathway. Um, so Brown does have a role. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Education is the most powerful weapon that you can use to change the world. Thank you. Oh, they'll kill me if I don't do this. We're having a symposium on the 21st, putting education at the forefront with the voices of us, of individuals who have been incarcerated, who have been successful. We want to be at the forefront of the conversation. It's at the Met High School, 325 Public Street. If you can attend, please attend. It ends at 1. It does not end at 3. That's a misprint on the flag. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I work at Open Doors, we're an agency in Providence. Our mission is to uh, strengthen the communities by supporting the formerly incarcerated. We do a whole bunch of things. Uh, for example, we contract with the Department of Corrections to provide uh, discharge planning services. We run a 19 unit public housing building, which is the only one in the state that actually you have to have a felony record instead of not being allowed to have a felony record to live there. Uh, and we. Uh, uh, we run a program called Nine Yards, which is what I'm mostly going to talk about today. I've worked there since 2004 when I graduated from Brown. So uh, my lesson there for you is that if you stick around, there's a lot to do. And you can save a lot of money in grad school. Um, so uh, for the first nine years, I did policy work, focusing on ways to change laws. Uh, we, we successfully returned the right to vote to people on probation and parole. We helped decriminalize marijuana. We made a drastic change to the probation revocation laws in the state. Uh, and uh, three years ago, I started this project called Nine Yards at Open Doors. And uh, that concept being going the whole nine yards to end the cycle of crime and incarceration. Uh, and that's really been the basis of my perspective on education. So I'll mostly talk about that part of it, what I've done. So uh, I've always thought that the, the work that we do around reentry is sort of like pushing a boulder up a hill. Uh, you can push really long and really hard, but if you don't get over the hump, 
people are going to slide back down. So I wanted to do a project where we could push long enough and hard enough that that wouldn't happen. People wouldn't end up back where they started. And so this project is unique. It's unique for uh, a reentry program across the state because we provide intensive services to a small number of people. It is expensive, what we do, and we can only do it for a small number. Uh, but we work with people uh, starting in prison for at least six months, uh, providing academic, vocational, cognitive classes. Uh, then they are released, either paroled to us or uh, they come on their own to our transitional housing program where they live uh, in subsidized housing for about six months or more and we provide intensive supportive services. Uh, and I want to take the time to make sure to thank uh, Ralph, Will, Ken who's here, everyone at the DOC for helping make this course possible. And also want to add, because no one's mentioned it yet, uh, to make sure to thank the PD Green program, which was started recently at Brown, which has been a really big boon to uh, what we've all done so far, and I'm excited about that as a way that we can continue to, to collaborate with Brown students. Another way that uh, Nine Yards is unique is that we randomly select the people that are in the program. So instead of getting the most motivated students, we get people who otherwise wouldn't sign up uh, some of the hardest to serve. We get the full gamut, but uh, people who, who generally wouldn't join. Um, so that's unique, that's important for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is because it allows us to actually prove whether what we're doing works. So, so far, it seems to be working. Uh, we released our first uh, study with a grad student uh, who works with Professor Bruce Western at Harvard, uh, which is a randomized controlled trial uh, because our whole program is a randomized controlled trial, which showed that so far we've reduced felony recidivism by 40% and time in prison by 31%, and sort of we're on track, hopefully, to reach statistical <coughs> significance within a year. Uh, so as an aside, I just want to say there's a big difference between an evaluation that shows that a program reduces recidivism with the participants, the ones that signed up, and a program that shows that based on a randomized controlled trial, that it, the program is what reduced recidivism. So uh, it's just a big, it's a big part of the way this program was designed and it's an important part of looking at the way we're trying to help uh, the general population in prison. So uh, I think I've figured out some things over the, over the last three years. Um, one, this is possible. It is possible to make a revolutionary difference in someone's life, to drastically reduce crime, and to pay for that with the reduction in prison spending. That is possible. I believed it when we started, I still believe it. Um, also, what everyone here believes is it, it, the students that, ha that we work with in prison have a tremendous amount of potential. They place a high value on education. Um, also, it is unclear to me exactly what role academics has in the reentry and the rehabilitative process. Um, so most of what I've learned has come from the lives of the 60 or so men that we've worked with over the past three years, so I'm mostly now going to tell stories, um, starting with Ed Coulter. So uh, I met Ed about three years ago, and it seemed like pretty much every time I tried to talk to him, we talked about how he didn't want to talk to me anymore. Um, so uh, it's important to me that you get to see him, so I'm going to play a quick video here. What if people would be interested in the, being interested in this program, well, me personally, I need good time, because if I'm not getting no good time from this, I'm not in any other program by any management, I can be out there running ball, lifting weights, playing cards, doing something else with my time. Look, the way, I, the way I've learned it is a strong survival. So when it comes down to it, I'm going to cook my family on my back and walk over these people. You know what I'm saying? To get to where I need to get to. But you gotta understand that I'm an iron person. I need to get a question on me. Something has to give me, man. I Seriously, I'm putting in everything I can, do, but something's gotta give. But like, I have, a, you don't want us going to hold? Or give us time so we can let our aggression around the vulnerable door. Once they have you in the system, there's <coughs> a 95.999% chance you're coming back. You can't run from your past because your past will always catch up to you. you know, no matter what it is, uh, no matter how hard you try, you know, your past will always catch up to you. 
Okay, so Ed was serving a four-year sentence for robbery. Uh, he started selling crack when he was about 14. Talked about how he had drink a pint of Hennessy every day before he went to school. He dropped out in the ninth grade. Uh, he and his friends would uh, get drunk and beat each other to a pulp as a way to, to feel excited, uh, feel something. Um, and when he joined Nine Yards, he tested about a seventh grade level. He was 30 years old. Um, so four months later, So uh, Ed has a, a, a bunch of sort of deficits that he was dealing with. Um, one of them is a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and he told me when he was uh, in our classes, he told me, now the voices in my head tell me to study. Um, and uh, he, he finished, uh, was released from prison with uh, four college classes and a 3.0 GPA. Uh, he moved into our housing program, and at that point I lived in the program, so I actually shared an apartment with Ed for about uh, seven months. Um, he signed up for CCR right away, and he was an obsessed student. All he wanted to do was study all the time. Uh, that lasted three weeks. Uh, he pretended to go to school for another month and lied to me, uh, and then uh, you know, eventually he had dropped out. Uh, that was two years ago. He has not returned to school, but he has also not returned to prison. Uh, he's worked about 10 low-wage, minimum uh, skill jobs, many of which we've helped him find. The truth is, there's a good chance those are the only jobs he will ever work. Uh, I once tried to get him into a pre-apprenticeship program for the Pipe Fitters Union, and he failed the uh, entrance exam the, for math. Um, so I talked to him last night, I invited him here, because I wanted to see if he would speak, but he was, he's at a job interview at a temp agency. Uh, he said, uh, education is a luxury. It's a luxury I can't afford. Uh, Ed's academic level was pretty average for the students that we were dealing with, uh, but we had some students that were really standouts, and we tried to focus on them to see if maybe we could accelerate their movement forward, uh, doing the best that we could with the resources we had, so that when they finished, they could get on sort of a different track. Uh, so we identified four of the first 15 students, and we tried to get them into the talent development program, which is this really amazing program at URI. Uh, we were working with them. Uh, really, they were full-time students. They were getting sort of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We helped them with their college applications. Uh, and um, uh, they, were all, they were all really bright students, some of uh, Will and Ralph's best, uh, who excelled in the ACI. And I have uh, actually a packet that, if anyone's interested, um, that with their co four college essays uh, here, because I just want you to be able to, to read them if you're interested. Um, and I'll read an excerpt from one of them, <laughs> Rennell's, uh, who was serving a nine-year sentence for robbery. He said, at the age of 14, I started out on my own. Working kept me busy and out of trouble for a while. I didn't mind working, because hard work pays off. At least that's what they say. It hasn't paid off for me yet but I keep trying. At the age of 17, I was blessed with my first child, a son, by my best friend. At that point, I was no longer working, I was selling drugs. Selling crack is a whole new life. It requires a lot of time, patience, and a hardened heart, but I adapted. The greatest opportunity I've come across, other than being a father to my son and a lover to my soulmate, is this URI program. I believe this is one of those things that are a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I am determined, dedicated, and well-disciplined. I've been waiting for this opportunity for many years. Um, of the four applicants, none were accepted. 
uh, after they all got out, they all enrolled in CCRI, um, none passed the class. Um, it's been two years since they were released. Uh, one of them died of a drug overdose. Um, one uh, relapsed on heroin and is serving five years for a B&E. Um, one was stabbed recently. Um, he almost died and he lost half a lung. And the other I haven't heard from in a year since he got a misdemeanor warrant and sort of disappeared. Um, so, you know, what could, what could have been possible uh, had they all had the support, had they all had the, uh, the scholarships uh, to, to attend uh, a university? Um, I think they, they could have done what they had dreamed that they could have been. Um, out of the 60 students that I've worked with, two have been lucky enough to be in uh, the Sunshine program and actually get associate's degrees, uh, which is a, a sort of a, a miracle for students at the ACI um, to be accepted into this program. It's something that uh, it's, it's a rare opportunity. Um, what most would take most students eight years, they finished in four. Uh, so I had one. Uh, get out of prison recently, and one was released about 14 months ago, um, Jelani. Uh, got out right after finishing his 60th credit. Um, and I also have the essay that he wrote for us. Uh, right when we start Nine Yards, we asked them to write an essay about something that changed them. And he wrote his essay about the Sunshine Program. He wrote, uh, getting high and into trouble were the two things I was good at, and I was already locked up, so what's the worst that could happen? But after I got my free scholarship, I stopped gave me the opportunity to cut my nine-year sentence in half. It changed my life. Um, for eight months after release, he worked at a job at a mattress recycling company. Uh, a lot of my guys work there. They often come home with nosebleeds and asthma attacks. Uh, and now he works another low-wage, low-skilled job. Uh, he's doing great relative to most of the men in my program. He has his own apartment, but he's one check away from being destitute. Um, my last story is about Stuart. Uh, he, he was a successful, bright kid from a loving family who had done well in school till his life sort of rapidly fell apart in his late 20s and he received his first and only criminal conviction for a 10 year sentence. He's uniquely gifted academically uh, and just as important he sort of came to us with the skills to learn because he had been successful at a young age in school and, and, and had a good education, uh, which, you know, frankly just made him starting out a very different type of student than the ones we normally work with. Uh, for nine months he was in our computer repair program, which we run in prison. It's a really popular program. Um, but Stu's the only person we've ever had who passed the sort of grueling uh, A plus CompTIA certification test afterwards. And uh, he is now sort of on track to enter a uh, computer repair field. Uh, so I think of sort of what we do with Nine Yards um, as, uh, well, sorry, our, our main goal, you know, from the start is to try to get people so that when they leave prison, they can embark on a career path. That's, that's what we're hoping for, right? Um, and it's a great goal. And I think of what we do is kind of like trying to make it to Mars. Um, Stu made it, right? But uh, unfortunately, most people aren't going to. Um, it's not possible. They can try. They probably fail. But in the process, they might make it to the moon. And uh, a lot of our purchases is made it that far. And considering everything, that's pretty damn good. So I started out by saying that I wasn't sure what the role of academics is in the reentry process, and it's something that I still think a lot about. Uh, I know that struggling and overcoming, figuring out how to learn, gaining confidence from that process, and building the relationships with our staff through the educational process is, is crucial to uh, the way that Nine Yards works. And I know that we need to be teaching, but I'm not really sure what it is that we should be teaching uh, still. Um, I know the students are really excited to learn, uh, but I know they are particularly excited to learn something that will get them a job, uh, something that uh, will help them make a living when they get out. And this might seem obvious, but when I started Nine Yards, I was really excited about teaching the sociology of uh, the prison system or theater. Um, and th they are excited to learn those things, but what they really want to do is learn how to survive. Um, So I, 
I think I think we've been able to do a lot in this program. Um, uh, one of those things has not been really uh, particularly success with college degrees, but I believe that that's possible. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of intelligence and potential in the prison system. Uh, there's a lot of creativity uh, behind the bars, and people are there for a long time. So there is so much that we could do, uh, and frankly, we're not going to be able to do it here in Rhode Island. We're not going to be able to make use of all of that potential that's there uh, without your help. Uh, if, if we want to be able to create the type of program that can get uh, all these men degrees um, and allow them to get associates, bachelor's, even graduate degrees, uh, we just, we need to do a lot more and, and hopefully you guys can help us do that. Um, so I don't know if, how far we'll get or, you know, if we'll get there, but I know that those guys are, and women um, are there, they're waiting. So, thank you. begin by asking um, the panelists, um, asking the panelists if they have any questions for each other. Um, and, and if you do, that's fine. If not, we'll get some microphones going here. And, uh, did you have something you wanted to ask? Did anybody on the panel want to ask each other questions? Or shall I open it up to the... Um, I, okay. I wanted to ask all the, all the panelists who run a program somewhere else, if any of their programs offer good time, uh, and if not, or, or if they do, sort of what's that like? Mine doesn't, um, and actually I noted that was one of my notes to start asking about you yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. We do all the good time. And Bells does. Bells does, but CCRI, particularly first of all, is a oh, very CCRI, CCRI does. Would you like to know how much? Yes. <clears throat> Three days a month off their sentence. <clears throat> Fifteen days for completion. So typically a semester is just three and a half to four months long, and that results in 25 to 27 days per course. Okay. Sure. I have a little bit of commentary about the good time. Some years ago, there was a national problem of prison overcrowding, and states addressed that in various ways. Yes. Rhode Island increased the time, the good time as we call it, as a way to reduce overcrowding. Some states might have just done early release, but I'm pleased about the way we approached it because it's almost Pavlovian that we encourage people to get on programs. When a former assistant director would tour with me, she would say, I don't care if you're here for the good time, you might learn something. So it gets them in the door, it alleviates overcrowding, and has the benefit of exposing more people to programming as Nick's first um, Inmates said, I'm here for the good time. Got him in the door. We do have LCTA. Yeah, but it's not quite the same. What's LCTA? In New York, you get six months off your sentence if you've done two years of college. Mm. That's good. Well, this is more than six months. Anybody else have a question? Amy. Yeah, I have a question. This is from the interested faculty perspective. Could you use the mic? Sure. Um, so I have a question, actually, for everybody who's spoken who runs a program is, so, Will, you said that the faculty at CCRI, this is part of their normal load, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what about at the other programs, um, Columbia faculty, John Jay faculty, um, Cornell faculty, etc. is this actually Princeton faculty? Is this part of the faculty load, or is this done on a volunteer supplemental basis? Um, yeah, for for Columbia, it's done on a volunteer. It's supplementary. It's not part of. Um, we've had one professor who has um, the chair of the department allowed his postdoc person to get uh, course relief by doing it, but that's not the norm. Ours is all part of uh, people's loads, and actually we worked out an agreement such between Hostos and John Jay that if you're Hostos, even if it's, John, you know, that wherever you're at, it counts as part of your load, and are now working on a larger agreement that anyone in CUNY can teach in the program and have whatever CUNY campus they're at and have it count as part of their load. Same, same with us, which we have Kaya over there, this is the head of the 
education that's happening inside the prison, also Dino. It is part of their load. Um, we are a little over a year in existence, so we're learning a lot, and we will be switching over to some form of adjuncts with specialty focuses for courses that we're teaching. What about at Princeton and Cornell? Uh, I'm over here. Yeah. What happens at, at Princeton? Is everyone is a volunteer? Everyone's volunteer. We're not even. We're not even close to that. Yeah. The idea that it would would be uh, course related. At Cornell, I think Ralph stepped out from okay. it. Okay. We'll ask him when he comes back. It's an overload. Yeah. Anything else? Joe. Oh, um, I was wondering if anybody is working with jails and how the programming changes in a jail versus prison. Um, yeah. So um, the program that we're doing in, in jails, uh, it's not Columbia courses, uh, mainly because we don't know how long people are going to be in the jails, whether they can actually complete the course. Um, and people, you know, they're, they're going to court all the time and it's just uh, having a, a program where they can actually earn credit um, is difficult. But what we use the, the Rikers education program as is a way to, it's also, it's with adolescents and young adults, so it's a way to re-engage them in an education system that has typically failed them and they're um, not interested in as much. And uh, when they go upstate, they learn about what college programs are offered if they go upstate. And um, if they come home, then uh, they can participate in Columbia programs, um, the Scholars Program or the Just Arts Program, which is for high school students. Thank you. <coughs> I just want to thank you all for being here today. Um, and I was curious, uh, I'm really interested in deliverables and how we measure um, the success of these programs. So when you know, Nick had mentioned 40% you know, reduction in recidivism and how each program goes about their sort of unique set of kind of collecting that data. And I wondered if anyone who's, who kind of spoke today could expand on how, the, kind of maybe what variables you are, you are measuring um, and if you could just provide any insight on sort of how you go about collecting that data. So I can say that for us, I mean, I think that's the million dollar question. How do you define success when it comes to these programs, you know? Um, and I think, okay, the, the lowest, setting the bar really low is recidivism rates. How many people have gone back to prison, which is entirely unfair because we don't ask that about universities. We don't say how many of your students went, you know, got involved in the criminal justice system and that measures the success of your university, right? So this is not, we don't teach anti-recidivism. Um, but so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing for us is definitely um, how many students attend university when they come home. They're all guaranteed a slot in CUNY. How many go to university and then the next level, how many get the degree, um, you know, and so on. And so in that way, we have more than a third of our students who've come home are full-time CUNY students. And another third are in the process of getting there in the next uh, eight months or so. And then an, an, an less than a third are perhaps not so likely, but involved in our alumni network. So, you know, being connected to us, being connected to a university culture is a big part of success too. But then I think there are all these intangibles that it becomes so difficult to measure. Like, uh, how did this change me as a person? How did I become a better communicator with my family by sitting in a, a writing class? Um, you know, how did I, think of myself as capable of more in the world, um, you know, and, and think about not just job, but career. Uh, and those are really difficult to measure. So we do a lot of, we're, we have studies that involve kind of case studies of akin to some of what you were doing here, what, how this has impacted people, how it's changed their relationship to education, um, and how it's changed their relationship to their families. Have I inspired, because I went to college, I now inspired my daughter to go to college with me or, you know, things, uh, things of that nature that you can see only by fleshing out a full portrait and not just with numbers and statistics. I also agree. Our, our measurement is somewhat different. We focus on the Big Ten, um, to advocacy, self and others, resilience, these sort of things. I started out by saying that our, our school is project-based um, and I don't really 
think I articulated that well. When I say project-based, it means that we identify what the student wants to do first. And then it's our responsibility to actually fit the curriculum into what the student wants. My project was Billy Taylor House. The way that I met my uh, writing requirement was I wrote a proposal for this program. That's how I met my writing requirement. Um, I had to write a grant. Uh, I took a grant writing course. I physically wrote a grant. I received $75,000 for that first grant that I learned how to write. Um, I had to do uh, math, I had to do statistics, I had to go around this community and actually find out what was missing in this community. I had to go on the Providence Plan, look at the data, this amount of single mothers. So this is how um, I measured as, as far as uh, was I meeting the requirements for my course by the work that I was doing and what I was getting at. But our main focus is actually we, we measure off the Big Ten. And James, remind me where the credit comes from? The credit, we, we partnered with Charter Oak State College, um, and Charter Oak State College is a college out of Connecticut, which is one of, I think, four degree continuation schools in the country. And the thing about it is they accepted all of my credits. I actually finished with my bachelor's in a year and a half upon release. I was released in 2000, December 9th, 2000, no, December 10th, 2009. And if I didn't, because everybody else was telling me I had to start all over, and that's why the question I asked was how long does it take to finish? I came home at 40 years old, um, and I didn't have the luxury of spending another three to four years in school. I had 90 credits, I needed to finish fast, so I was able to finish in a year and a half through, Charter, through Roger Williams University at the time, which we then switched over to Charter. Um, the way that we're, because they're still a very young program, the way that we're measuring, uh, we're developing an evaluation model um, for the prison education program, teaching inside. Um, for the scholars program, when they come home, um, what we're, we're doing is, is collecting stories and seeing how the path has changed. Right now, the numbers are very small. Um, so our recidivism rate for less than 30 people is zero, which is wonderful. I hope to keep that up. But um, it's really doing a longitudinal study of just keeping in touch and get, keeping them involved and seeing how their trajectory is different from what it was when they first went inside. I was very moved, Nick, by your idea that these, um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but what I took from what you said was that, these, that the successes are partial and, uh, and sometimes halting, but successes uh, nonetheless, and so the, the question for me is how do you, and I think you, you, you showed that by stories is how you yeah. capture that, yeah. uh, but how do you capture that? Because you know, you, that some of these people you talked about, some people wouldn't think that this was successful, but it strikes me as it's very successful. It's moving to see someone working through a math problem and saying, <laughs> I didn't think I could do this. You know, that's, it's a moment, it's, a, it's short in some ways, but it strikes me as a big success, and so yeah. I don't know how to, well, so we had a graduation recently and you know we celebrated the successes the people anecdotally who were still out who had done good things and uh, there were a lot of people who didn't make it to the graduation but it's about celebrating the successes but the the randomized component and the the, the evaluation that tests whether or not the project has worked is key because Right. Otherwise, if we did what we were doing, which is outreaching to the high risk people, and then at the end of the day, you know, we said, well, we had, uh, you know, out of these 15 or 60 guys, you know, 10 recommitted crimes, uh, people might say, you know, and two are dead, the people would say, well, this doesn't sound like a very successful program. But you compare it to the control group, uh, which, is, uh, which is sadly abysmal. And, and that's how we try to say, you know, that's how we can prove that we made a difference. Rob, do you have something to say about the about how you guys what you're doing on evaluation? Yeah, well, it, it's a tough question and um, uncharted waters for a lot of the programs. I yes. think that the budget in, immediately goes to service and education, and then secondarily, for many of the programs, it comes around to okay, do we have someone or do we have a graduate student? Do we have someone in the um, uh, data science department or someone that could help us with this. So um, the key here is to, to get a control so that you um, aren't just getting self-selection bias data, right? Um, the departments of corrections have databases with 
a tremendous number of selectors if, they, if you can get it provided. You can FOIL that data. Um, you can also use the websites that are provided by the Departments of Corrections to get that data, including racial data, including age, um, oftentimes number of incarcerations prior to college and afterwards, and if you do it weekly or iteratively, you can get changes over time. This is, this is something that really should be developed, um, and frankly, the, the, the projects across the country should team up yeah. and pull all of this. And actually, it's important to remember that recidivism, this term recidivism, is a very, very misleading one and very baggy one. You know, So people go back inside because they violate parole, some people go back inside for committing new crimes, and those are really different things, and they're generally, when recidivism is talked about, it's as if it's just this, you know, recidivism rates, but that's an enormously complicated thing that needs to be remembered. Also, with us, we, we like to measure, like, a lot of our students are uh, uh, connected to mentors when they come home, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them in, in, are in employment, so we like to measure, did they move up in employment, or did they acquire um, better paying employment? So this is something that we definitely have. Maybe, maybe just a, a a comment, uh, Baz, to add to what she's saying, um, because I know here, when we think of recidivism here in the state of Rhode Island, we have to think of something called 32F. So you have a lot of folks getting violated and being sent back to prison for something that they never actually got convicted of. And that's simply because the folk in power who created that process drew a web so wide so they wouldn't have to go through like a proper like judicial process, however we think of that, in order to give somebody due diligence. So this notion of recidivism is already corrupted right. from the outstart. Right. And so it, it, it's a structure that's set up to, in he, the, the video you showed, the brother said it in the video. He said, man, this thing starts trapping you. you it's like it's hard to get, get out of the web. So that, that is gonna give you a misreading all the time. It's a, it's a structure set up just like Brown is set up to process a student out. Right. That system is set up the, to other way the other way around. Yeah, it's insanely easy to get thrown back to the prison when you're on per, uh, parole or probation, which um, you know they all are when they leave. They have some condition. You know, in effect, someone's following you around to see what you're doing. And you go to a party where someone smokes some pot, and you're at that party, oops, back in. That's hardly recidivating. And those two systems are skewed for, for that very reason. I mean, I can actually tell a story about one of, another one of our students speaking of that um, that shows just how easy it is and how quickly your whole life can be destroyed by something you know so, so minor. So we had a student who was full-time at John Jay, philosophy major, pre-law, um, also got, I had connected him with an internship at a law firm, they ended up hiring him full time, so here he is working full time at a law firm, going to school full time, um, still on parole, you know, in his 20s, gets, a, gets um, a DUI, of which he was later cleared, so he was, it was incorrect, they, his, his um, PO violated him, threw him in Rikers, and he was in Rikers for 32 days without seeing a judge, would never have seen a judge po could possibly still be sitting there now um, if we hadn't pulled strings, intervened, you know, to try to get him just to see the judge. In 31 days, he could have lost his entire semester. Um, if we hadn't intervened to call his employer, he certainly would have lost his job. Um, and then later, all of this was, he was cleared of all of this with the help of a lawyer who gave him pro bono services. So, and he's calling, um, he's calling us every single day from Rikers saying, I'm going to die here, please get me out of here. I'm going to die. Like, so that shows you how, yeah, you can, in one fell swoop, <coughs> everything that you built toward on the outside, gone. He's graduating, by the way, this is the spring. Just a, general, just a general comment about that. Rhode Island had, at the request of the governor, a commission to look at that very issue legislation was proposed, it did not pass, we'll have to wait and see what the future holds. Um, yeah, could you use the mic, because then we can get <coughs> capture you better for the, um, the yeah, so. This is, um, 
prison to college pipeline. <coughs> Would that it was, or were. But my question is, just actually fairly brief, I think. I'm wondering if James's program or um, Nick's program are able to serve inmates who get released who are not part of or will not be part of College Unbound or Nine Yards. Is there any services? I mean, maybe Open Doors does that, but are there any services for just the you know, transition services for the people not enrolled in your program? I'm sure, I mean, there are a variety of services across the state that are open to people. For example, addiction services, you know, Providence Center serves anyone with addiction issues. Uh, specifically around reentry, sort of, uh, you know, we focus on employment work and we serve anyone coming to our agency. Uh, they're, uh, they're sort of like a hodgepodge of relatively small but um, existent resources. But yeah, I mean, nine yards just serves nine yards. Yeah, with us in some, I mean, we, we're operating with limited funding. We've been successful with, with raising uh, grants and getting some support for the program. But at the same time, all the work that we do inside the prison, we do it for free. We're working with 180 to 100 students. And the only way that we get paid is when the students transition out. So hopefully we increase that cohort, which will allow us to sustain that. These students that are not registered with our program when they come home, what we do is we try. We're not just going to, I mean, I was incarcerated. I'm, I wouldn't leave anybody. But at the same time, I'm realistic. I have to refer them out to some sort of other services. You know, I, it just as I'm thinking about this, I think one of the things I've, I've learned this morning, and, and maybe it's um, not very profound, but it, um, that if you're thinking about um, a, a prison education program in a college, um, that the, the way in which um, residential colleges provide all these services for their students, no one would think at Brown of, of uh, having a student here without a full range of elaborate services to make college possible for them, um, that, that's, that we need to think about that as well. Um, you know, we do, no one would think of teaching a course at Brown without um, you know, um, uh, counseling services and um, addiction services and, and um, tutoring services and there's just a, the range of what's available to Brown students needs to be available uh, to, um, so I mean, that you might think about these as transition services or um, something else, but it's, in some ways it's serving um, the, the students inside the same as we serve the students outside. Um, and, and that I hadn't quite thought about. I thought about a, a courses separate. You know, well, we bring in these little boxes. <laughs> you know, here's your box. Here's your, here's your history course or something. A, a friend really of mine, he was actually released from the Department of Corrections. He's actually on my advisory board. He's actually on the board of TTEP. He was released from the Department of Corrections. He went to URI I think, for a semester and he transitioned into Brown. Mm -hmm. And he said he learned from here, he learned how to live because he, he wasn't working while he was here. Mm -hmm. He graduated from Brown, then he went to, I think, Harvard. No, he went to Yale and he, he got a law degree from Yale. Mm -hmm. And he's actually um, Andres at Arabi. He, he went to school here and he said the services here what allowed him to sustain himself while he was in yes. school. Well, he wouldn't be the only student to say yes. that. <laughs> you know, if we can ask the undergraduates and, uh, here, you know, what, what, how much money of the services they're accessing, and it's true. Yes. I'd be uh, curious on kind of a broader scale, because I'm really fascinated. We have in the room today, we've got New Jersey, we've got uh, Yale, Connecticut, we've got I mean, we've got everyone in the room from educational institutions. What is, how are colleges and universities going to inform public policy? Because it seems to me that we back into public policy, you know, it's sort of the what's missing in this discussion, because you all are doing such great work. I can see here where this collaboration it is a great think tank right here, but public policy and how it approaches education for the incarcerated, it's a political issue, but it's also a huge public policy. So. Just wondering how you all are thinking about that individually and how that collaboration among the elite universities uh, that are in the, in the field playing in it now, how can you can together uh, inform on the broader scale, take all this energy and, and upscale it mm -hmm. or scale it out? Um, what, what we're working on right now in terms of policy um, is a, a campaign to reduce um, aging people in prison. Um, that is 
again, the Justice in Education initiative is just a couple of years old. Um, so that's our first policy initiative. There's um, a film called uh, Rosalie Coming Home, which um, Frances Negron Montaner, she's a, a professor in the film department. Um, they followed uh, the release of a woman in her 70s coming home after spending um, 30 years inside and uh, just her transition and the challenges of reentry. Um, so, and then they, they released a, a white paper and, and so there's a campaign around that. And um, also, I think more, uh, I guess, more aptly, we're working on a campaign to get rid of the box, which is um, a box on Columbia's application that you have to check if you have a felony. And so working on that at sort of on the campus level and then of course applying it to um, housing and job applications there's a there's a national ba abolish the box or ban the box campaign so we're working on that at home and then hoping to see that spread further um, I think for us the biggest way that we impact policy is in some ways indirectly which is by producing an army of people yes. who connect with organizations I mean no one who's impacted by this program whether it's the faculty the incarcerated students, the formerly incarcerated students, the outside students, the campus as a whole, everyone comes out so deeply passionate around this issue. So they then go and get involved in these, uh, in the Close Rikers campaign, mm -hmm. in the Ban the Box campaign. I mean, SUNY just banned the box, and SUNY had one of the worst, worst, I mean, most egregious restrictions and attrition, application attrition rates because of the box on their application. Um, we've, I've witnessed students who just give up on SUNY because of how much they ask. So, um, you know, all kinds of, and also the education, education not incarceration, uh, education from the inside out coalition, which is pushing, the Pell thing is not done, right? This, we've, we've got 69 schools, that's a drop in the bucket. It needs to be abolished altogether. So. Um, a big part of what we do is is produce that justice army that's going out there and doing it. I like the justice army. <laughs> um, we're, we're gonna, I, I want to ask you to help me thank the panelists. We'll take a minute. And thank you for your questions.